On the phone, it is always a pleasure to welcome back to the program David Dayan, independent journalist and uh, writing now for, well, I mean, you've been writing for everybody, but uh, your latest piece is in the American Prospect, uh, essentially on the uh, w- the Treasury Department's well, it seems like their uh, intense reluctance to uh, really uh, provide any meaningful regulation for banks. Welcome to the program, David. Thank you for having me, Sam. All right, so let's start first with the Brown Vitter banking bill, uh, which has been introduced in the Senate. Tell us about that bill and why it's needed, despite the fact that we have this wonderful um, uh, Dodd Frank. Right. It's uh, officially known as the Terminating Bailouts for Taxpayer Fairness Act, or the TBTF, which also is an acronym used for Too Big to Fail Act. And really what it would try to do is end this practice of uh, banks being too big to fail, enjoying subsidies from the marketplace because they can borrow funds at a cheaper rate based on the perception that investors will never lose anything because uh, they'll be, banks will be bailed out if uh, they ever get into trouble. So they borrowed at a cheaper rate than their smaller rivals. Uh, they're incentivized to take on more risk. Uh, they threaten the economy, and then they get a bailout afterwards. So the idea is to guard against that. And Brown Vitter uh, mainly does that through the imposition of additional capital requirements. And what that means is is that uh, the the case today is uh, it, it kind of depends on what you what you look at in terms of accounting standards. But uh, for every hundred dollars that a bank lends out, uh, ninety seven of those dollars they cover through other borrowing, uh, and only about three dollars or so do they cover through selling stock or retaining their earnings. So that's a 3% capital ratio. Um, that's, that's really the case. If you look at an apples-to-apples apples comparison, if you look at the accounting standard that, that they go by in Europe and the rest of the world, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Now, there were international accounting standards put in, uh, in, in a process in Basel, Switzerland, that would increase those capital standards uh, to roughly – Seven or eight percent, but there's some accounting games being played there, as I'll get into later. Um, <clears throat> what Brown Vitter would do, and we should say that's known as uh, Basel uh, two or three. Three. That okay. would be Basel three. Um, uh, America is still uh, implementing Basel two, okay. by the way. Um, but what Brown Vitter would do would be to throw out that process, actually. And uh, move to a very hard capital standard of eight to ten percent for smaller banks, and a five percent capital charge for any bank that has over five hundred billion in assets. That includes the five largest banks in America, which control or hold about sixty-three percent of GDP in their assets. So those banks would have a, a surcharge and would have a 15% capital standard. So for every $100 they lend out, they would have to have $15 in stocks or retained earnings. And that means if the value of their assets go down, they can cover it through their own funds, through the, the stock or the capital retained capital earnings. Uh, instead of having to go for a bailout, it prevents the need for a, a bailout because the bank has to cover their own mistakes uh, rather than going to the government. Now, for them to cover. Them. Forgive me. I want to get just a little remedial here, so that people sure. really understand um, uh, what what what's going on. When you have mm-hmm. the, the bank is basically making these bets or loans in some respects, <laughs> and some I mean, but that's loans, but that's but, but that's uh, bets might be a better uh, term. But that's but I mean that's what it is. Uh, every time somebody loans you money, they're making a bet that you're going to be able to pay it off, and that they're going to make money off of the interest rate. And how risky a bet you are to pay it off is reflected in how big of an interest uh, you are charged. And uh, right. so, uh, you know, people understand this. And if you have bad credit, uh, then your interest rate's going to be higher uh, than it would be otherwise. And so this is what's going on here. And the, 
this is to prevent, if too many of those bets go south, that the, uh, the banking institution is left without the, enough money to cover those bets, essentially. Right. Uh, basically, the way it is right now, uh, something like a 3.7% drop in the value of the assets of the bank would mean that the bank is insolvent. It would mean that they don't have the funds on hand, the liquid assets, to actually cover those losses. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is that the banks will tell you that they're very healthy and very well capitalized. Um, but there's this element uh, known as risk weighting. Uh, and this is a very important point, that under the Basel process, under the current American standard, uh, banks are allowed to change how much capital they need based on the perceived risk of the asset. Uh, and if they have uh, what are known as less risky assets, they can risk weight their capital so that they actually have less capital, but they claim that it's more because these assets aren't risky. Now, what we saw during the financial crisis is that assets that were seen as triple A these mortgage-backed securities that were rated by credit rating agencies as super safe assets ended up losing lots and lots of money. So the idea that they were less risky, which is what they would be seen to be if they were AAA assets, didn't matter in the context of a financial crisis. So this is, this is the main problem with the Basel process and the current process. And Brown Vitter gets rid of risk weighting altogether. It now says you have a certain amount of assets, you have a certain amount of liabilities, and this ratio is the ratio that we're going to use. Right. You cannot massage that dynamic by claiming, hey, we, you know, we loaned the money to, uh, to uh, Sam's producer, Matt Bender. He's really good for it. So it doesn't, you know, we may have <laughs> loaned him 100 count. bucks, but it's, we're just going to count it as uh, 50 bucks because he's so good for this money. Exactly. Exactly. And now, of course, we know what happened uh, during the financial crisis. Uh, all of these rock-solid uh, loans and bets and derivatives, and, and, and obviously we're, we're simplifying this dynamic a little bit because the bank then turns around and sells the debt, and uh, its right. performance uh, is a, is a, uh, of this debt is a function of what they can get for this debt, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we're simplifying it here. But that's the right. basic gist of it. Yeah, and the important thing to know is that Brown Ritter, Ritter gets rid of risk weighting, and it says that, that you have to, in reality, show in your books that you have this percentage uh, uh, available to you to cover losses that you take. Uh, there are some other things in Brown Vitter, but really the main thing is, is that, that it's, it's uh, capital requirements that are heavily boosted that will make the system much safer and will uh, you know, require less of a need uh, to even think about bailouts because banks would have to cover their own losses. Before we get into uh, the um, well, if this is the, the question as to whether or not this is redundant with Dodd Frank, uh, the uh, right. the reaction of obviously the big banks to this and their um, their lobbyists in the form of the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, <laughs> w let's just talk about this piece of legislation in and of itself. Is this, I mean, is this a good piece of legislation? In other words, does this go far enough, uh, uh, you know, putting aside for a moment the, um, uh, the likelihood this gets passed, is this a good piece of legislation in terms of, of doing what it sets out to do? Yeah, I mean, I think capital requirements are an important part of any stable banking regime. And uh, there, are, there are articles and, and books out there. There's a book by uh, two professors, Martin Helwig, and Anat Admati called The Banker's New Clothes, which I highly recommend, which has even higher uh, uh, recommendations for capital ratios. But <clears throat> uh, this, this would certainly uh, do a lot to focus on, on a very pure standard, very simple standard that uh, even these regulators could figure out, I think, um, that would make the system safer. It would, it would allow... Uh, banks to only take risks that they could they could cover really with uh, uh, existing capital. Uh, there are other things in the law, as I said, um, where uh, 
you could uh, prohibit the Federal Reserve would be it would would have to prohibit uh, non depository uh, institutions institutions that don't get insurance from the FDIC they don't take deposits from access to all of their uh, lending sources cheap lending sources the discount window and all these federal support programs so basically it would wean off these non depository institutions from the safety net that has been built for banks and only allow those banks that have you know individual deposits to uh, take advantage of those resources so that that also would tend to make the banks uh, a little bit safer it would it would essentially say that uh, if if you want to take these risks uh, you can you just aren't going to get access to all of these special gifts and resources from the federal government as a result so that's another part of brown vitter uh, overall there, there are some things in there that uh, show the power of the community banks because they would they would have a lot of their regulatory burden lessened under this law uh, not a lot, but a certain amount at least. Um, and it, 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 we have a system that has incented big banks for so long. This is an example of, of the community banks getting a little bit back in the game. And uh, they're, not only would their capital burden be lower, but uh, it, would, it would reduce uh, certain regulatory requirements on, on community banks. So uh, overall, I think the law is important. I don't know that it's the only law that you need. Uh, to uh, ensure stability and safety in the financial system and prevent future bailouts, but it's an important component. And uh, would the would the would the effect of this law be essentially to break up these banks? I mean, in other words, will they uh, will this create a um, uh, a playing field essentially that m- no longer makes it worth them being so large? It certainly could. Uh, Goldman Sachs issued a report that said it would. Um, Standard & Poor's issued a report that said uh, it, it probably would as well. Uh, it would, it would uh, have the equivalent of forcing the raising of $1.1 trillion of extra capital uh, for these large financial institutions. And they might not want to do that. They might want to split up their component parts and get under that, I believe, $500 billion uh, threshold where they don't get hit with the extra capital surcharge. Uh, And if they do that, uh, it's not only about reducing size, but it's reducing the uh, risk appetite for these banks because uh, above the $500 billion threshold, they now have to be much more conservative. They have to take in a lot more capital and uh, so you're not only reducing size, but you're reducing the risk in the system. And that's uh, uh, pretty much the, the important thing, I think, uh, to understand is that uh, what we want is, is a financial system that's less likely to just go haywire. And uh, increasing these capital requirements is a, is a large step in the right direction. Okay, so um, uh, the bill sounds like it's a good idea, and it will never happen. Tell us why. Right, exactly. Uh, even though it is, uh, as, as we've been saying, bipartisan, you have these strange bedfellows, uh, David Vitter, uh, Republican from Louisiana, Sherrod Brown, Democrat from Ohio. Uh, the missing component in that is support from the executive branch. And what we saw is a week before... Uh, Brown Vitter was released. Uh, Mary Miller, who is the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, she's a holdover from the Geithner era, uh, and she still works at the Treasury Department in a very high capacity, gave a formal speech to uh, a group uh, called the Hyman Minsky Conference, which is at a, a Bard College, I believe. And she basically said that Dodd Frank already solved the too big to fail problem that there are already robust capital requirements in the system, that there, it's unclear whether or not there is a subsidy for big banks by virtue of their size and the perception of a bailout, uh, perception of too big to fail. And basically, everything's fine. Let us implement Dodd-Frank. Let's go home. That was basically the message of Miller's speech. And it was a big formal speech given in a public setting a week before a bill that 
you know, envisioned larger capital requirements, uh, more financial regulation was about to be released. You can't see it as anything but a rebuttal or a prebuttal to that law, to that uh, bill being dropped. And uh, it basically says that, uh, as, as Neil Borowski, the former Special Inge- Inspector General for TARP, told me, it basically says that uh, when it comes to regulatory reform, the shop is closed. Treasury does not believe there's a problem, and they're not going to want any further financial regulation to be uh, contemplated. Now, let's talk about these, uh, the, the supposed reasons why um, uh, Brown Vitter is superfluous. First off, in terms of Dodd-Frank, I mean, on this program we've talked about it. I think you and I have talked about it in the past. Uh, Dodd-Frank, in many ways, does not really exist yet. I mean, some parts of it uh, do, but it, it is constantly being um, litigated, literally, in the courts, uh, mm-hmm. courts that are controlled by conservatives who are very hostile to regulation. We have seen element after element of Dodd-Frank um, undercut both on a, uh, both in terms of the rulemaking process um, yeah. from where it starts, and then it gets even more uh, debilitated and the perception that it's going to get debilitated in the courts has essentially really sort of taken, I mean, not just softened out the rough edges of Dodd-Frank, but really taken a lot of the teeth out of it. Right. And, and that's, those are the rules that have actually been promulgated. Uh, I, I believe the number is about one-third of Dodd-Frank rules have actually been implemented at this point, uh, which means two-thirds have not. And this is almost three years after the law was passed, and deadlines for regulatory uh, agencies to write the rules have been missed time and again. Uh, and so it's, it wasn't really a law. It was a promise to write a law. And what I'm saying is two-thirds of that law has not yet been written. So we don't know what Dodd-Frank is going to do. And, and of course, many of the uh, things that Mary Miller cites uh, haven't been used at all. Uh, things like uh, resolution authority. If a bank gets into trouble, they have now this uh, allegedly orderly process that the FDIC can go in, even if it's a large institution, and uh, put it into receivership and do the things that it does with smaller institutions. Well, we have no idea if that's going to work or not. And in fact, uh, the idea of a large international bank uh, that has a global reach and all of this interconnectedness can just be orderly resol- uh, resolved in an orderly fashion uh, is, is, you know, to at least many critics, just uh, chimerical. That, that, that there, there is no possibility that this is going to be done in an, in an orderly fashion. Um, there's, there's the issue of living wills, which is another thing Mary Miller brings up, that the banks are supposed to give uh, a roadmap, essentially, for how to unwind them if they get into trouble. It's called the living will process. Well, the living wills uh, have been completely inadequate. They've been a joke at this point. In fact, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve, who are managing the living will process, uh, key officials have said that they're going to take action against the banks if they don't give them something reasonably adequate uh, in terms of living wills in in the next, uh, uh, I believe, the deadline is October. So, the idea that, that these kinds of laws are protecting the system right now uh, is just fantastical. We, we don't know. We have no idea. And, in fact, what we've seen so far uh, doesn't, shouldn't inspire a lot of confidence. 